Hello, my name is Gerard Thornton. Thank you for joining me today. It's a pleasure for me to present an encore virtual presentation of a story on Nellie Bly. It's a name that you may have heard before, but you may not remember who she was or what she did or what makes her relevant so many years later. Now, uh, growing up in Brooklyn, I first saw her name on amusement park and it wasn't until years later that I found out that Nellie Bly was indeed a real person, although she wasn't born with that name. And today we're going to go through the life and time of a lady named Nellie Bly. So Nellie Bly was born on May 5th, 1864 in a town named after her family, Cochran's Mills, Pennsylvania. It's a little bit away from Pittsburgh. She was born with the name Elizabeth Jane Cochran. Her father, Michael, had come to the United States as a laborer from Ireland, so he wound up doing pretty well for himself. Now, Elizabeth's mother, Mary, was his second wife. He had 10 children with his first wife and five children, including Elizabeth, with Mary, his second wife. Um, unfortunately, he died when Elizabeth was pretty young, only about six years old, and the estate had to be worked through two families uh, in order to be settled. And by the time it trickled down to Mary and her children, there was very little left, except for some furnishing and an old wagon. So Mary and the five children found it uh, very difficult to make ends meet, and so Mary moved the family to Pittsburgh to try to find work. Uh, she did wind up marrying again, but the relationship with her new husband was uh, tempestuous, and he, was, uh, he turned out to be a, uh, a drunkard and abusive to the family. And this would no doubt um, influence Elizabeth Cochran's uh, commitment to be independent and not reliant on any male figure in the years ahead. In 1885, uh, Elizabeth was reading a newspaper article in the local uh, paper, the Pittsburgh Dispatch, and in it the editor was bemoaning the fact that he was raising girls in his family and girls didn't really amount to much in society, they didn't make a lot of money, uh, they didn't hold really good jobs, and uh, so he didn't know what to do with girls in society. So this, this really uh, incensed Elizabeth, who was, again, very independent and uh, strong-willed. And so she fired back a scathing rebuttal to the editor of the newspaper and saying, instead of talking about how much trouble women are in society, why don't you help them? Why don't, why don't you offer them the same... Um, ability to advance and to develop as you do with men, and they won't, they won't be a, a, you know, a drain on society. And she wrote it in a way that was so intriguing to the editors, they actually invited her to come into the offices of the newspaper and to make herself known, and she did. So she stopped down at the offices of the Pittsburgh Dispatch and met with the uh, managing editor and the editor who wrote the, the article, and they were so impressed by her um, her uh, s strength and her uh, drive that they offered her position as a journalist on the newspaper. Uh, although they had thought that she would be best suited to uh, write on certain society matters, such as who got married, who was throwing parties, uh, uh, travel, and other things, Elizabeth didn't want to do any of that. She, she always had higher ambitions for herself. And she wound up suggesting to the editors that uh, she do something more, uh, more worthy of, uh, of her ability. And they said, well, what do you have in mind? So she says, why don't I travel into Mexico and do an expose on the Society of Mexico, and they say, oh, I don't think this is a great idea, um, but she perseveres and she convinces them to let her go into Mexico. Uh, at this point, she is given a pen name, which she will use for the rest of her life. Most women at the time wrote under a pseudonym, and Elizabeth Cochran wound up becoming Nellie Bly, uh, apparently after an old Stephen Foster 
folk song. So she's Nellie Bly, and she gets her mother to ride along with her into Mexico and to uh, report back on what she finds there. Uh, she winds up spending six months in Mexico with her mother without any other chaperones or, or uh, aides from the newspaper. And she reports back on um, the foods that are there, on the, uh, on the relationships of the men and the women, on politics, and on the geography of Mexico in an effort to sort of dispel some of the myths and rumors uh, that were being perpetuated in, uh, in the country on the Mexican uh, lifestyle. However, at this point, she, she starts to become critical of the president of Mexico, Porfirio Diaz, who was known to uh, stifle any dissension and sort of uh, stay in power by any means necessary. And when she suggests that he was having journalists imprisoned uh, so is that he would, his uh, corruption wouldn't come to light. Diaz actually started discussing imprisoning Nellie Bly. So after six months, uh, Nellie Bly, with the threat of being imprisoned, returns to the United States. Um, and this story gives her some, some publicity with uh, not only the newspaper, but with the readers as well. As this was a pretty daring feat for a young woman to go into Mexico at that, uh, at that um, time period. Now, uh, when she gets back, again, the newspaper wants her to start writing on more mundane items. And uh, she decides it's not for her. She's not gonna write about things like uh, uh, flower shows and whatnot. So in 1887, she gets all of her life savings together and puts a short, resignation notice on the desk of her, of her editor. And it says, headed for New York, watch out for me. And with that, she goes to New York City, again alone, uh, just, uh, just with her own drive and ambition to, uh, to make something of herself. Unfortunately, New York City at the time doesn't really want any female journalists. They have a few on staff at some of the newspapers, but um, no one seems to be opening doors to Nellie Bly, and she almost runs out of money. Four months later, she's still looking for work <clears throat> until she finally convinces the editor of the New York World, which was run by Joseph Pulitzer, to give her a uh, interview, which he does. John Cockrell is a fairly rough and tumble editor, and he sits there with Nellie Bly, and he's uh, pretty impressed with Nellie Bly's experience and uh, the story she did in Mexico, and he decides he, he'll give her a shot. In fact, he says, we actually have a story that we're working on. We're trying to get someone to, uh, to go out in the field and investigate conditions in a mental hospital for us. So Nellie Bly and the editors sit down and she says, what exactly do you need me to do? And they say, We've heard rumors of neglect, mistreatment, and uh, terrible conditions in the women's lunatic asylum on Blackwell's Island. Now, this was a very notorious institution on an island which is now called Roosevelt Island. And uh, it shared uh, space with a, uh, with a jail and with a, a smallpox hospital. And um, there were rumors that bad things were happening to the patients there. So Nellie Bly agrees to take the assignment, and she says, I have one question. Once I get into the hospital, uh, how do I get out? And the editors say, we'll come to that when the day arrives, but just get in there and we'll figure it out. So in order to get admitted to this asylum, she has to feign lunacy. So before long, Nellie Bly finds herself in front of a judge who orders her to go to Bellevue Hospital for an examination and they evaluate her and they say she's she's deranged and she has to go to Blackwell's Island and she so she's starting off on the first leg of her journey into this expose of the asylum and she's uh, admitted into the building and she finds out very quickly that all the rumors about the institution were in fact true the patients were subjected to uh, a terrible behavior from the 
staff and the nurses. They were given bad food to eat, spoiled food to eat. The, the uh, housing establish establishments were drafty and cold. They were given ice water baths. And um, perhaps worst of all, they were forbidden to speak to each other. So these, these women who were supposedly being treated for mental illness had to sit in complete silence or else they would be subject to punishment. And Nellie Bly writes that whoever goes into that asylum that isn't crazy would come out crazy just on the conditions that she would be subjected to. So after 10 days, Nellie Bly is able to um, get enough information to the newspaper and they send an attorney to the uh, to the hospital that um, who uh, who gets Nellie Bly released and they were shocked to find out that one of their patients was actually a journalist about to do a uh, groundbreaking expose on the condition she found there. Now the story she wrote was uh, was it came out as a, s a series of articles in the New York World, and it was le later compiled into a book entitled 10 Days in a Madhouse. And this got the attention of the Department of Charities who oversaw the, the management of these institutions. And before long, there were great improvements in the conditions and the training of the personnel and the grounds at the asylum. In fact, an additional $850,000 a year was budgeted to help the conditions at the, at the uh, institutions. Because back then, uh, mental illness was treated basically with just um, patients being locked away from society. It, re it was really um, very primitive treatment for mental, mental illness. It wasn't understood. And, uh, and Nellie Bly did a lot to shine a light on what uh, these patients were undergoing um, far from the public eye. So after, after her story on the asylum, she is, she is sort of a, uh, a very popular journalist in, um, in the public's eye. Now Nellie Bly, along with her expose work, she did a number of interviews that were very interesting. Even today, if you, if you get a chance to read them, they are, they are available. And uh, she interviewed uh, pr uh, prize-winning prize boxer John Corbett, um, the first female candidate for the United States presidency, Belva Lockwood, who, um, who ran, as president, uh, ran for president in 1884 and again in 1888. And she also interviewed one of her, her real heroes, which was um, Susan B. Anthony. Now, Susan B. Anthony, uh, to most of us, is a fairly stern-looking lady with uh, gray hair and glasses on a coin. But uh, if you read the interview by Nellie Bly, Nellie has a way of really coloring these people and, and turning them into real human beings and not just an image. Now, in 1889, a story that uh, Nellie Bly had first pitched for, to the newspaper sort of came back um, on the desk of the editors, and they called her in. And at the time, the, the book Around the World in 80 Days, written by Jules Verne, was very popular. And Nellie Bly came up with the idea of, well, maybe uh, I do a story that sort of mimics uh, what Jules Verne's character, Phileas Fogg, did in trying to go around the world in a, in a uh, record time. So they came up with the idea that they would put her on a journey in an effort to beat Phileas Fogg's time of 80 days. And they would not make any special arrangements or accommodations for her. She would only be able to take whatever travel was available to any other person. And, but she would go alone and see if she could beat the 80-day benchmark. So Nellie Bly said, I'll do that. And they ask her, when can you start out? And she says, I can start today if you'd like. So they gave her a, a few days of no, advance notice to get ready. 
And during this time, another publication in New York City, the Cosmopolitan, uh, heard about it. And John Brisbane Walker, who, rent, who was the uh, head of the newspaper, decided he was going to do the same thing. In fact, he was going to do one better to the New York world's attempt. He was going to send his female journalist, Elizabeth Bisland, around the world. And not only would she beat Jules Verne's 80 days, but whatever time Nellie Bly did her trip in, Bisland was going to do better. So at this point, we had two newspapers, New York World and The Cosmopolitan, getting ready to set their female journalists out on this round the world journey. And uh, at the time, for a woman to be going unescorted around the world through all different countries um, could be pretty dangerous. So Elizabeth Bislin has about one day to prepare for her trip. And she decides she's going to pack as light as possible. And she brings a couple of suitcases. Now, Nellie Bly has a whole different um, personality. She's not going to bring any suitcases. She's going to stuff everything she needs or thinks she needs into one bag. So she gets a 16-inch grip sack, like a doctor's bag, and in it she puts a couple of shirts, one gown, some writing implements, cold cream, and some underwear. And that's all she does. That's all she packs to go around the world. Uh, along with this, she she wears her soon-to-be iconic. Ulster duster coat and a ghillie hat, and away she goes. Um, on November 4th, 1889, both women set out. And at this point, Nellie Bly has no idea that another woman, journalist, was on her tail. On the same day, Nellie Bly sails east on the Augusta Victoria for England. Elizabeth Bislin goes westbound by rail towards the west coast of the United States. So the two women leave on the same day, going in different directions. On the first day out of New York, however, Nellie Bly comes down with horrendous seasickness. And every time she tries to eat a meal, she has to run out on deck. The captain of the ship actually invites her as a celebrity, or soon to be celebrity, to his table to dine with him. And as soon as they bring out the platter of fish she has to run out on deck again, completely seasick. And she hears the other passengers snickering behind her saying, how is this woman going to go around the world in record time if she can't even put up with a voyage by sea? But uh, Nellie Bly remained undaunted, and she uh, continued on to England, where she was met with an agent of the New York world who gives her some interesting news. They got a telegraph from... a telegram from... Uh, Jules Verne himself, the person whose story actually uh, spawned this entire trip, and he invites Nellie Bly down to his house in Calais, uh, France, to meet with him. And Nellie Bly, of course, she's looking at the calendar and her watch, and she knows she doesn't have any time to spare, but she can't give up this opportunity. So she does. She meets, meets Jules Verne and his wife at his house, and they discuss her trip, and... Uh, Jules Verne actually has a map of the journey that Nellie Bly was intending to take, penciled across his wall. And uh, Nellie Bly gets to see his study, where a, a book that he's currently writing is in progress. And he uh, tells Nellie Bly, I wish you the greatest of luck. And when you make it around the world and beat my character's time, I'll applaud with both hands. So they have a toast of wine. And Jules Verne and his wife wave goodbye to Nellie Bly and give her their best wishes. So from there, Nellie Bly is going full speed, uh, taking um, trains and ships eastward on her passage, while Elizabeth Bisland is westbound still. Now, in, uh, during her trip, Nellie Bly sees some interesting things. She goes through... She goes through the Suez Canal. She goes uh, through the Gulf of Aden um, to Ceylon, which is now Sri Lanka. Um, she gets to dine on some exotic food, and uh, curried shrimp becomes her favorite dish from her trip there. Uh, in Singapore, she winds up buying a monkey, an ill-tempered monkey that would attack anyone that came close, and 
She named him McGinty. And the image of Nellie Bly traveling around the world with her monkey becomes a sort of a, um, a brand of Nellie Bly. So she's um, doing things her own way and uh, sort of blazing a trail um, with her monkey. Now, in, uh, just before Christmas Day in 1889, Nellie Bly is boarding a ship for her leg to uh, across the Pacific Ocean to San Francisco. And she's at the uh, ticket agent when they tell her, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Bly, but uh, it looks like the other woman's gonna beat you. And she says, what are you talking about? And they say, this lady, Elizabeth Bislin, she's headed westbound and she's, she's left Yokohama three days earlier than you. She's gonna get to New York before you will. And this is shocking for Nellie Bly because she had never heard this name and, and she had never heard that somebody was co going around the world um, in sort of a race. I mean, this was, a, this was a, a race that was unknown to her at that time, but she's not, uh, she's not uh, defeated in any sense. And she uh, says, that lady can do what she'll do and I'll do what I'll do. And she, she gets on board the ship and uh, heads across the Pacific. And um, she's, uh, the ship is, is hit by some very heavy weather. Uh, typhoon season is, uh, is upon her and uh, the ship makes, um, makes a difficult passage uh, towards San Francisco, but with the skill of the crew and with the dedication of the engineers are able to get to San Francisco in an excellent uh, transit time despite the weather. And uh, Nellie Bly had made a lot of friends along the way. In fact, the chief engineer of the ship um, carved a, uh, a little couplet on the, on the machinery in, in the engine room saying, uh, for Nellie Bly, we'll, we'll win or die. And uh, so she made a lot of, uh, a lot of friends. She, she had a, a lasting impact on the people she met. Um, so in San Francisco, she boards a train that's going to speed her across the, the continent, or so she thinks. Unfortunately, the West Coast was hammered by a record snowfall, and it took uh, some time for the, the tracks to be plowed out, and it took uh, precious time away from her, her trip itinerary. Uh, Finally, she makes her way into Chicago where she's met with uh, uh, great fanfare. She's a celebrity. Everybody in the continent, in the country, was watching this trip. Now, New York World did something interesting. Not only were they, um, is, were they uh, advertising where Nellie Bly was in, in each uh, day's, or where they thought she was in each day's um, issue, but they had also created a guessing game and they said whoever would come closest to guessing the exact time of Nellie Bly's arrival back in New York City, they would, be, they would win a all expense paid trip around the world. So people were sending in all these uh, sweepstakes um, coupons to try to guess how long it would take Nellie Bly to get around the world. Um, so in Chicago, the uh, Chicago uh, uh, press association meets with her, they take her out on the town, uh, they treat her like, like royalty. Um, they're very proud of her and they also bring her to the Chicago Board of Trade where the, um, the stockbrokers on the floor give her a standing ovation when she comes in. And uh, she's very thankful for this kind of uh, welcome in, the, in uh, Chicago. So the next leg of the trip is by train to Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, she's met by her mother, Mary, who gets on the train along with some railroad officials and um, government officials that want to see her to the next and last leg of the journey to Jersey City. Now, Nellie Bly arrived in Jersey City on January 25th, 1890. And as soon as her feet got on the touchdown on the platform, a official timekeeper clocked the time and it was 72 days, six hours, 11 minutes after she left Hoboken in November. And she easily beat 
the time that Phileas Fogg had used to uh, go around the world in Jules Verne's book. An enormous assembly of, of people crowding around her. She's ushered onto a ferry across the Hudson River to Manhattan. And she is taken by carriage to the offices of New York World, where a huge bouquet of flowers is sitting. And she's welcomed by the uh, staff of her newspaper. Um, now, after, after breaking the 80-day the record, um, she winds up going on a lecture circuit. And she makes a lot of money, actually, going across the country, talking about what she learned and what she saw during her trip. Now, Elizabeth Bisland actually did pretty well as, uh, on her trip as well, but she got stuck by, in, uh, in England by missing her connecting vessel. She missed the, uh, the fast um, canard ship and had to get on a slower one. And again, she, her ship was hit by uh, bad weather as well. And she wound up making the trip in about 76 days. So she also beat Jules Verne's time, but uh, Nellie Bly was, was the champion of this impromptu race. Uh, and the fact is Nellie Bly had a lot more coverage and a lot more publicity. So Elizabeth Bisland's trip really wasn't noteworthy um, as, as far as the papers go. In 1895, Nellie Bly meets a man by the name of Robert Seaman. He's 40 years her senior, and he owns a steel manufacturing company. They produce all types of uh, metal products, including uh, trash cans, um, boilers, fire extinguishers, anything that's made out of metal. It's an enormous company. And uh, she, they get married in 1895. Unfortunately, uh, her husband dies in 1904. In an unusual change of career, Nellie Bly actually takes up the management of Ironclad Industries and becomes the manager for their production. Uh, under her management, the company actually produces and patents the steel drum, the 55-gallon steel drum, which is still in use to this day. Uh, unfortunately, the company would falter uh, through, uh, through um, numerous financial uh, pitfalls. There was embezzlement, there was mismanagement of funds, and the company wound up becoming insolvent and going out of business. And Nellie Bly was forced to go back to work as a journalist after several years of working in industry. In 1914, Nellie Bly goes to Austria sort of to clear her head and she finds herself um, near the front line when the hostilities of World War I begin. And she winds up being the first woman war correspondent for World War I by reporting back from the uh, front lines in Austria. Uh, so she's there for a couple of years in Austria, and she comes back to the United States in 1918. And uh, she starts working uh, in different, uh, in different uh, modes for the newspaper. She, she does work with orphans, trying to find them houses, homes, and families to live with. And uh, she starts working uh, for different newspapers at the time. Uh, she's, her health has been failing from the time she got back from Austria and she, uh, she contracts pneumonia. In uh, 1922, she, she gets, um, she gets uh, brought to St. Mark's Hospital in New York City and she winds up dying of, the, of complications from pneumonia and heart disease on January 27th. 1922 at the age of 57. Now this is uh, this is the end of uh, the life of a woman whose um, whose career went from a, a no-name reporter in Pittsburgh to the heights of uh, celebrity as an uh, investigative journalist and to uh, an industrialist. Um, all within 57 years, she she uh, she made her mark throughout. And uh, in an interesting twist of fate, 
Nellie Bly was actually buried in the same cemetery as Elizabeth Bisland. Woodlawn Cemetery in Bronx actually holds the remains of both women. So after their race around the world, their paths once again diverged. They both worked in newspapers. Bisland would become an author and they would both marry wealthy men uh, that were fairly older than they were and then they would die both of uh, pneumonia um, at relative young ages or mid middle age and they were both buried in the same cemetery. So that's interesting uh, to note. And I don't know that they ever met in real life. In all of my research, I was not able to find the two women ever meeting. So uh, that is the story of Nellie Bly. I want to thank you for joining me. Um, as a quick note, Nellie Bly's face was cast as a statue, uh, and as a sculpture, and will be um, erected out on Roosevelt Island um, sometime in the near future. Nellie Bly uh, remains someone I think we should be knowledgeable of, we should respect, and we should continue to discuss in the years ahead as the treatment of mental health, the treatment of less fortunate, and the treatment of women is still very much in the newspapers to this day, some 100 years after Nellie Bly passed away. So that's Nellie's story. Thanks again for joining me. My name is Gerard Thornton. Stay safe and be well. And if you'd like to see more movies in the Noble on Watch series, please visit noblemaritime.org slash N-O-W. Thank you.